Um, hello to everyone. Hello to Liz Gould and Paul Fitzgerald. It's uh, very nice to, uh, to have you. Um, both of you are uh, true experts on, um, on Afghanistan and uh, you were there um, a few years before I got to Afghanistan. So we're uh, really delighted that you've agreed to, uh, to join us for this important uh, webinar. Let me just um, uh, begin by saying that my name is um, Valentin Mogadam. I'm Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Northeastern University. I'm also um, a board member of uh, Massachusetts Peace Action and a member of the Middle East Working Group. Um, and uh, I was born in Iran, a little bit of background. I was born in Iran um, and uh, you know, later at the time of the revolution became very active in the Iranian student movement. Um, and we were all hoping for a very progressive and um, a democratic Iran after the revolution, but that did not come to pass. Meanwhile, next door, um, something very interesting was happening in Afghanistan. So as I became increasingly disillusioned with, um, uh, with events and developments in Iran, I turned my attention to Afghanistan, where um, a, an experiment, a really exciting experiment, and a kind of modernizing socialism, pro-women's rights, and so on, was occurring. Um, so uh, around the mid-1980s, um, I began to contact um, uh, members of the, um, the delegation to the Afghan delegation to the United Nations and then ended up um, visiting Kabul um, uh, uh, in uh, January, February of 1989. At the time, I did not know of Paul Fitzgerald and Liz Gould, uh, but more recently, um, I have read uh, quite a number of their of their works, and I must say that um, uh, that uh, their their work is really um, very very important, very highly detailed, and um, and I encourage um, everyone to um, um, to uh, to look up their work, and especially their their book. Um, I want to remind those of you who are not aware of Massachusetts Peace Action that uh, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that works for. Um, a, uh, a, a more just and peaceful U.S. foreign policy um, through grassroots organizing, policy advocate, uh, advocacy, and community education. We promote human rights and global cooperation. We seek an end to war and the spread of nuclear weapons, and we support, support uh, budget priorities that redirect excessive military spending to meeting human and environmental needs in our communities. Um, we uh, also follow very closely uh, various developments around the globe, and tonight, of course, we're paying attention to Afghanistan, um, which is at present America's longest war. It is considered to be America's longest war because most people think that America got involved in 2001. But in fact, America got involved much, much earlier, and that will be the subject of our discussion uh, tonight. Um, America got involved, in fact, even earlier than people, some people think. So some people think that sometime in the uh, 1980s, as the um, uh, Afghan um, civil war was raging, as Soviet troops were um, engaged in the fighting in uh, Afghanistan, that at that point, America decided that, well, it had to uh, intervene on the side of the valiant um, Mujahideen. But in fact, um, that is far from the truth. That's far from the case. American intervention started long before then. And in fact, um, we are here to tell you the story. And um, uh, Liz Gould and Paul Fitzgerald in, uh, in particular will tell you the story of how the Carter administration, and in particular, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, quite deliberately lured the Soviet Union into what they wanted to create for the Soviet Union, which was a kind of Vietnam that would then spell the end of the Soviet Union as we know it. Um, so uh, we have some questions um, that, uh, that uh, Paul, Liz, and I have circulated, and, and, uh, and I think that also um, probably uh, engage some of you who are listening on, for example, 
Why is the U.S. still in Afghanistan? When did it first get involved and why? Um, what is the truth behind what everybody calls the Soviet invasion um, of December uh, 1979? Um, oh, hint, it wasn't an invasion. They were invited in. It took the, um, um, the CP, um, uh, the Communist uh, Central Committee of the Soviet Union, quite some time to decide um, to, uh, um, to, uh, to accept the uh, request on the part of the Afghan government to uh, come to their aid. Um, what have been the long-term consequences for the Afghan people, for the region, and for the world? of the Carter administra uh, administration's fateful decision in 1978-79 to support and armed what was actually a tribal, Islamist, highly patriarchal rebellion against Afghanistan's left-wing, modernizing, pro-women's rights government. Why was the United States on the wrong side of that particular um, contention? And finally, what can progressives do to put an end to the sorry uh, record of U.S. Uh, disinformation and what um, um, Fitzgerald Ed Gould called magical thinking um, about, um, uh, about uh, the U.S. foreign adventures? Um, Paul Fitzgerald and Elizabeth Gould um, are a husband and wife team. Um, they acquired the very first visas uh, to enter Afghanistan in 1981, um, and they were the first. Um, they were the first to be granted the visa um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, to undertake uh, interviews and observations there. Um, they uh, carried out a news story for CBS. They produced a documentary called Afghanistan Between uh, Three Worlds for PBS, and then they returned in 1983 to Kabul for um, a segment for um, ABC's Nightline, but they have a very interesting story about that. Um, and I think that I will just turn it over right now to uh, Liz and, um, uh, and Paul. Uh, can you just begin by uh, telling us how it was that you got interested in Afghanistan? And then we can take it from there in terms of, um, you know, some of the more recent developments um, that, uh, you know, that um, sort of go back to that, that period. So how is it that you got interested um, in Afghanistan? Well, back in, this would be back in 1978, 79, we actually uh, had started a little production company. Paul was working for a television station. We had an opportunity to do a documentary uh, about the SALT Treaty the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, that was one of the reasons that Actually Carter had been elected as a peace president, was to push detente and the SALT Treaty. And it was a very big deal at the time because uh, the Vietnam War had devastated the American economy and the American psyche. And uh, the whole idea of working towards a more peaceful and competitive, a more, more um, uh, less war relationship with the Soviet Union seemed to be uh, growing. And so we did the documentary and it was beginning to air right around, um, it was at ready to air and the Soviet invasion occurred. And what we witnessed having been working with people like Paul Warnke uh, who negotiated the SALT Treaty and John Galbraith who was promoting it and many other people who wanted to push for the SALT Treaty, we noticed a total collapse of any of the progressive people in Washington, it suddenly seemed to turn overnight. And that got our attention. It didn't make sense. It didn't add up. And so when we began to look into it deeper and deeper and realize that, and it, what happened about a month after the Soviet invasion, uh, the Western media was, uh, was expelled 100%. So it became an opportunity. So we acquired the first visa to go in and we got CBS News to back us uh, because they were actually dying to see what was going on and they had to work with us. We were independent. And so our first experience was with CBS News and that is number one in our beginning to understand magical thinking. Okay, as we returned from a trip where we witnessed a totally different on the ground experience, it was clear the Afghans were not comfortable 
with um, a, a Soviet presence in their country, but they were far more upset about the fact that there were attacks coming from Pakistan that were being orchestrated to destroy schools for women and basically assassinate officials and other kinds of mayhem. So we began obviously to realize right away that there was a problem in the, in the coverage that was coming from into the United States. So we bring back this exclusive story for CBS and they struggled for weeks because it wasn't the story they wanted. They wanted Russia in their Vietnam and they weren't getting, there were no really Russian in, in, in obvious uh, numbers in Kabul. So that was our first experience. And the story they ultimately did was basically about what, what, what wasn't actually seen, which was the Soviet military in, in Kabul. And uh, in 1983, when, oh, there actually, there's another story that's very important to this lineage of magical thinking. When we did the documentary, we got a phone call from Major Karen McKay, who was representing an organization that was backing Musha Hadeen. And she was very critical of the fact that we hadn't put in the documentary the issues of use of chemicals by the Soviets. Well, at that time, there actually wasn't any hard evidence. Right. We pointed that out. And there never her. would be. And, well, right. in fact, it was proven not to be an issue at all. Well, at that point, Karen McKay actually said, when we said, you know, it would be a lot better if you actually tried to get some hard evidence to prove your case. She immediately shoots back, we don't need proof. We know the Russians are guilty. So this kind of attitude being spoken by someone representing an official organization without absolutely had no concern at all. So here we have the CBS experience. Now we have Karen McKay. Then we go set up our second trip to Afghanistan. And that was with Roger Fisher from the Harvard Negotiation Project. We had already established the Soviets were desperate to get out. They had already communicated with Roger. Well, before we actually left on our trip, uh, we, we were sent an article from Variety that the man that who had hired us for CBS was boasting about the fact that they had shown three nights of Soviets crawling all over a, a Kabul. Okay, and the article explained all of this. And we were within weeks of going on our trip. So we go, oh my God, what's going on now? We haven't heard anything about this. We didn't know. Uh, we, did, we obviously missed the CBS um, a story. So we get to Kabul and there's no Soviet troops in the streets at all. It's yeah, right. actually less Soviets than in the first trip. Right. So we just can take that in and we do our trip. And Roger meets uh, with the high level Soviet officials that were sent down to meet with him. They tell him point blank, we really, we really want to get out. We, we're, we're willing to negotiate our way out. So before we actually leave Kabul on this trip, we got invited to an embassy dinner that was a weekly event. We ended up sitting at a table with representatives from the Quaker Mission, a young couple. And Jim, uh, we asked Jim, where are all the Soviets? There was a, a, a CBS document of films that the Soviets were crawling all over the streets. It was yeah. Russia's Vietnam. Right. And, and, and Jim actually looks at us and says, oh, the man, the, the, Eric Dershmid was the, uh, the filmmaker who did it. He said, oh, yeah, well, he was actually here for weeks. He was waiting for the Soviet troop rotation to take place. So what had actually been turned, Russia's Vietnam, the proof that CBS had been looking for all along, okay, turned out actually to be a yearly event. They'd been there for three years at that point. Yeah. At the end of March, when the snow melts, they send the troops from the north down and the troops from the south up and it causes a traffic jam in Kabul. So this man, Eric Dershmi, filmed that and CBS claimed that it proved it was Russia's Vietnam. This is how- uh, This is, the, I mean, it, it really shows you the extent of the deliberate yeah. disinformation that was so pervasive at the time. I mean, you and I were um, both following, uh, you know, events over there. Can I just, um, give a little bit of background for some of, um, of the members of our audience, just to create some kind of a context for folks. Remember that, you know, this is um, almost um, the height of the Cold War. It's the height of the Cold War, but it is also a time of a lot of third world revolutions, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is really freaking out the United States. 
So you see that there are things going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's stuff going on in Latin America. You know, Nicaragua is going to have a revolution. Soon Iran will have a revolution. Um, in Iran, in Afghanistan, they overthrew the monarchy. Um, actually, it was um, the king's uh, cousin, uh, Dawood, who overthrew him. And um, because of certain types of shenanigans and some um, uh, repression, et cetera, et cetera, there was then an uprising within the Afghan um, military, pro-communist, pro-left-wing um, officers who then carried out a coup that enabled the Afghan revolution in what they call the April 1978 Afghan revolution. Um, that uh, was uh, accompanied by a set of decrees by the ruling People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, which were so forward-looking. You know, Afghanistan had never seen anything like that. And Afghanistan was so much behind its neighbors, even Pakistan, let alone Iran. Um, and uh, those decrees um, were about compulsory schooling, women's rights, lowering the incredible dower or the bride price um, you know, for women, the rights of all the nationalities, because it's a multi-ethnic society in which the Pashtuns were the dominant society and all the way at the bottom were the Hazaras, who also used to be the slaves um, in, uh, in Afghanistan. But now we have um, a situation in which a new government comes in and says that all the um, ethnic groups and all the nationalities are part of the Afghan nation and they are all equal too. There was also a land reform program that was decreed, but of course that too was too much for um, uh, this, uh, you know, these patriarchal, tribal, Islamist types who then started uh, creating a uh, rebellion um, in the countryside. Um, meanwhile, Iran had its revolution in February 1979, and instead of the kind of government that had come into power in Afghanistan, we had an Islamist uh, government, um, an Islamist regime next door in Pakistan. There was also, you know, uh, folks that were allied to the United States, also very, very anti-communist, and there was this huge international conspiracy against um, Afghanistan. So that's just by way of um, uh, a little bit of context and background. Um, uh, Liz, you might want to continue. And then at some point, we might want to also talk about that recent article um, in a little bit more detail. But perhaps you can finish your story about um, the, uh, the work that you were doing, uh, you and Paul were doing in the 1980s. Well, it, what we were dealing with actually was the, the constant realization that facts did not matter. Uh, every engagement we had, whether it was with ABC Nightline, who Ted Koppel basically pitted Roger against basically a Soviet dissident instead of American officials to actually analyze this possibility. It was made very clear that there was no interest in the US government or American mainstream media to promote the idea that the Soviets genuinely wanted to get out. So by 1987, 88, we realized this thing called facts proof didn't matter. No matter how many more facts we dug up, the, the ones who were controlling the narrative and controlling the policy were, didn't care. So we really had to confront that reality. And I think that's all part of, again, our, our understanding of this thing called magical thinking, which I think, you know, today people can see and recognize that it's, it's going on everywhere, okay? But people may not realize how much it played a role very deeply and very um, overtly, there was no hiding it. They didn't have any concern about doing these things and making it clear that they kind of felt they had a right to. Maybe that's what imperial thinking was all about. So as we moved through um, the era, uh, you know, we moved through an opportunity to create a screenplay for Oliver Stone in 1992 about our story and discovered, you know, the limitations of Hollywood. And then in 2007, you know, what becomes the film that is the embodiment of the Afghan story is Charlie Wilson's war, which was the propaganda story. And that is what most Americans actually believe right. is, the Afghan, is the American role in Afghanistan. So uh, we finally did decide, you know, we got in and we wrote our book in 2009 and we decided we were gonna put our understanding of what happened, which included at that point, the whole history about Brzezinski and Carter 
and that will be more part of what you know Paul has with his um, uh, analysis of this article. But that'll be in that. Um, and it, 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 what was important, that's when we actually encountered Dr. Charles Kogan, who was the um, Directorate of Operations for, that's the chief, the chief of Directorate of Operations for um, the South Central Division and Near, East. and Near East, okay, 1979 to 1984. This is a pretty high level guy. He's working at a, at a very high level <clears throat> in the Afghan scene, okay, um, and he came to a, one of our book events and he basically said, your presentation of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan is very authentic, but I will argue with you about the legitimacy of the Novell Observator 1998 article where you uh, claim that Brzezinski claimed that the Soviets were sucked into Afghanistan. Right. So, okay, so we met him at that point. Well, in 2015, we decided to do a documentary and try and deal with a lot of these issues. And we ended up uh, connecting back with Dr. Kogan to interview him. And when we sat down at the interview, after you know, opening comments, he begins to tell us that, by the way, I met Brzezinski and I actually had the opportunity to go to him and say, I never believed that Novell Observatory article about you sucking the Soviets in. And Dr. Kogan told us on camera that he was quite shocked when Brzezinski said, oh no, we did do that. Yeah. You had your things going on in your division and the White House had a different thing. He yeah. totally was, Dr. Kogan was devastated. He did not want that to be true at all. Okay, so we, we really uh, you know, felt that this was an amazing, obviously, admission, but we didn't really think about what we were gonna do with it besides a documentary until this article appeared within the last month or so in 2020, basically claiming that the Novell Observator um, interview with Brzezinski is effectively the only proof really of this tricking the Soviets into Afghanistan and that this scholar decided to make that his purpose was to ultimately throw out the validity of the uh, Novell Observator article altogether. And that's what Paul is gonna to talk to you about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's very interesting um, because, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, the United States does like to take credit for some of these foreign policy victories, so to speak, um, and in particular, the collapse of communism. And Afghanistan was a very, very important part of that pathway, that road to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of world communism. But on the other hand, um, there, there, there has always been this uh, shroud of secrecy around what exactly occurred in 1977, 1978, 1979, 1980. So the idea is that all oh, these evil Soviets went in and well, we had to do something, you know, to help these valiant, um, you know, freedom fighters, as Reagan later called them. Um, and, you know, that's basically the story that was fed to the American people by the politicians and by the media, notwithstanding your efforts, uh, Paul and Liz, to tell the truth, and also the efforts of a handful of other people, Fred Halliday in the UK, my friend David Gibbs um, at the University of Arizona, he was elsewhere at the time. Um, myself, I mean, I tried my darndest to do, uh, you know, some writings and so on to try to tell the truth about what was happening um, in Afghanistan and to the um, Afghan people and the role of the United States. But of course, you know, nobody was really paying attention. Um, I should also mention, um, you know, the late um, Selig Harrison, who oh. you knew and of course I knew as well. And um, he, um, uh, you know, he was one of those truth tellers, to be sure, um, along with Diego Cordovas and the, the book that they wrote um, later on. So um, again, for our listeners, just a, a reminder, we've been talking about those early years in Afghanistan where a revolution had taken place um, in April of 1978 and immediately there was a conspiracy, an international conspiracy, largely spearheaded by the United States. And now we know um, even more about this, spearheaded by um, not only the Carter administration and Brzezinski himself, but unfortunately also by 
um, President Carter at the time. Um, I have had this conversation with Paul and Liz where I have said that, you know, Jimmy Carter has always been my favorite, um, you know, former president. And yet the role that he played um, was a very unfortunate one. He made a very, very um, wrong, uh, disastrous mistake um, in intervening in the internal politics of, of Afghanistan and in allowing Brzezinski to just, you know, run amok. <laughs> So uh, an article um, was recently published in, um, uh, in an online uh, journal of historians, which I read and then I shared with Paul and Liz. And this is an article which um, is entitled The Myth of the Afghan Trap, Brzezinski and Afghanistan, 1978-1979. And that article uh, claims that there is no proof that President Carter's um, national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, did lure the Soviets uh, quite deliberately um, into um, Afghanistan in December 1979. Uh, uh, and of course, Liz has made reference to a 1992 interview that uh, Brzezinski gave to the French news uh, magazine Nouvelle Observateur in which he boasts about how the Soviets fell into um, his trap. So this recent article uh, tries to dispute that and says that that French magazine article uh, 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 interview was you know filled with errors um, uh, Brzezinski's words were mistranslated, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we are here tonight to hear from um, uh, Liz and Paul, and now Paul in particular, to tell us, in fact, why this uh, recent article is wrong and why, in fact, Brzezinski was right in admitting <laughs> that he and Carter did indeed lure uh, the Soviets into the invasion. And let me also say, en parenthèse, as we say, that when the uh, Soviets did intervene, when the Red Army came in, um, in late December 1979, um, we heard, I heard, you know, a lot of people uh, on, you know, in my camps and that sort of thing, um, uh, we heard that the Soviets were planning on leaving by the spring. Mm -hmm. Of course, that never happened. So take it away, Paul. Well, I, once again, Val, thank you very much. Uh, it's the context that's important in this. And I uh, don't know how much your audience remembers about what it was like in, at the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, down in Washington, this entire group of what we now refer to as neoconservatives, the war, the war part, uh, were desperate. They had been delegitimized. They had been building up and building up for decades from the 1950s through the 1960s about the advance of Soviet communism around the world. And so there were these policy people like Zbigniew Brzezinski, who with some other of his like-minded people like Richard Pipes as an example, were working on ideas to try to figure out how to undermine Soviet influence, how to roll it back actually, wherever they could. And they were very upset with the idea of containment, which, is, which had come about at the end of uh, George Kennan's invention, so, so pretty much at the end of World War II containing the Soviets, and they could see that the Soviet influence was everywhere. So um, this would, they, they were constantly looking for an opportunity to do this. So you had a lot of fringe people on the outside of the establishment who uh, finally would gain admittance to the establishment with the failure in Vietnam. And so you get the Carter administration coming in a year after that, 1976, January 1977, and Jimmy Carter brings with him Zbigniew Brzezinski. Both had been members of the Trilateral Commission. Both were intimately connected with David Rockefeller. They were both protégés of David Rockefeller. And uh, the two of them were kind of like a tag team. And people think of Carter as being this very peace-minded Southern Baptist uh, minister, president who was going to bring peace and harmony to the United States after the trouble of Watergate and the Vietnam War. Well, that that was a deception, unfortunately. And so Brzezinski, on the other hand, was given very, some very, very special powers. Now, what was so interesting was is that 
This happened before they even went into the White House. At St. Simon Island in the fall of 1976, they sat, Carter and Brzezinski sat and reorganized the White House into two fundamental committees, the uh, Policy Review Committee and the uh, Special Coordinating Committee, the SCC, which Brzezinski chaired. And so as a result of that, everything, Brzezinski decided what would be in the SCC's domain. And so he basically took everything that was important, including covert action, and put it inside the SCC. When they get into the White House, he gets Jimmy Carter to make the National Security Advisor a cabinet level position. He gets an office basically across the, across the hallway from the president, gets to see him so many times during the four years that um, the uh, on in-house record keepers at the White House just finally gave up. Brzezinski would literally had permanent access. He could walk in on the president. He's even been interviewed bragging about the fact that if something was important or if somebody was in there that he didn't want influencing the president, he would just simply walk in and interfere and put his own opinion forward. So his, the, the control that Brzezinski took through this special coordinating committee, including over, over uh, covert foreign policy and uh, CIA action was almost, almost complete. So that was the kind of backdrop for what happened in 1978 to 1979 with Afghanistan. So uh, Brzezinski, whether he lured him in or not was the big issue. That was the, that was the deciding factor. So um, from the moment Brzezinski's uh, interview appeared in 1998, the yeah. Novella Observatory article, people came forward and said, oh no, 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 this is not possible, absolutely not possible. He's just boasting. He's just <laughs> boasting about it on, on the one hand, and the other people said, oh no, the system doesn't work that way. People like Charles Kogan said, no, 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 system doesn't work that way. I would have known completely. I was in regular contact with uh, my, my counterparts at the State Department and, and, and that we just didn't, we, we weren't doing that sort of thing. So, but there was an enormous amount of activity that was going on in Afghanistan. And the fact was, is that Brzezinski, from the moment of the April Revolution in 1978, Brzezinski got right on a plane and went to China and proposed to the Chinese a military alliance against the idea of detente. In fact, you know, Cyrus Vance, the uh, State Department uh, Secretary of State, actually had to keep reassuring the Soviets that Brzezinski was not working against their interests. But what Brzezinski had actually done was Brzezinski had brought in a press secretary for the uh, uh, SCC in which he would basically have the SCC go right to the media and tell the media what the policy of the president was, which was basically Brzezinski's policy. So he completely subverted the process of the other committee, the uh, PRC, as well as the function of the idea of the SCC, which was to, um, which was to coordinate all these, this information. He, he got even so good at it, he actually wound up preventing uh, various kinds of meetings from happening of people of influence within the government who were supposed to have access to uh, President Carter. He, uh, he even denied access to uh, Stansfield Turner, the CIA director. And he would schedule meetings so that people who were basically promoting Brzezinski's position would get to see the president and the other people would be out of town or, or just simply not have any access whatsoever to the president. So this went on and on and on and on and on. So uh, finally, uh, yeah, we moved to Dubs. Mm -hmm. The Dubs assassination. Um, what was I wanted to ask, uh, sorry, I just wanted to interrupt. Well, didn't all of this also lead to um, Cyrus Vance's uh, resignation? Right, right. well, well the Iranian. Did. That was Iranian. over the Iranian issue. Yeah, although it was all, yes. it was the same all along. Right. He was constantly sidelined. So yeah. right in the middle of this entire operation, you have a new ambassador who goes in who had been approved by the Dawood regime before he went in in the spring of 1978. But the revolution happened in the meantime. So he, he goes in there and he goes around and talks to some Afghan exiles before he goes and he says, what can I do with this regime that's in there? That we actually spoke with someone who had, was approached by Adolf Dubbs, the ambassador, before he went. And he said he wanted to know whether he could work with the PDPA or not. So 
we went and we spoke with Selig Harrison at one point in the, in the, in the process, and we asked him, if, I'm looking at all the evidence here, and I'm seeing the fact that this looks as if Brzezinski was setting it up so that the State Department ambassador, Adolf Dubs, couldn't be successful. So Sig Harrison had actually gone to Kabul in the summer of 1978 and spent hours with Adolf Dubs, and Dubs had laid out his whole plan, the objective of which was to keep the Soviets out of Afghanistan any further. They had been there actually since the 1950s because the United States had turned down a military alliance in favor of, of um, Pakistan and also Iran. So they didn't really need Afghanistan. And Afghanistan was very independent uh, and very, uh, very nationalistic. The government was very nationalistic of the crown. So at any rate, um, Sig Harrison went in, he got the whole story from Adolf Dubs, the fact of what he was going to try to do, he was going to work with Hafezullah Amin, the man that the Soviets would ultimately overthrow, and he was going to try to move him step by step closer to the, um, to the United States, but not so close that the Soviets would feel jeopardized and want to invade. So Sig said specifically that this was exactly, he said, Dubs's plan ran counter to what Brzezinski was trying to do. And he thought that what Dubs was trying to do was all nonsense because Brzezinski believed, like the neocons, that the Soviets were expanding their empire. They were bent on getting to the Persian Gulf to steal our oil and uh, that that was an inevitable consequence of this and that he was just wasting his time. So at any rate, in the meantime, Brzezinski had worked with the Pakistanis and the Chinese openly to fund uh, armed resistance to what the PDPA was trying to do. They were coming in over the mountains and the PDPA would even admit to the fact that they weren't, they hadn't really done things very well after the revolution. This is yes. all a year before the Soviet invasion. I think that's the key. That's right. This is all the activity that our friend uh, Connor Tobin, the author of the article who's claiming that there's no validity to the claim that Brzezinski actually uh, tricked the Soviets in. This is all the evidence right. that exists that he claims doesn't exist. Even in the, even the, the Washington Post was even reporting it in the spring of, uh, of, 1970, of 1979. They were openly, the Pakistanis were openly training Afghans. There were 2,000 Afghans being trained come over the mountains and disrupt the, the workings of the PDPA. And that by that, they meant burning down schools, specifically for women, assassinating political officials, going on and on and on like that. So this is part of what we've been dealing with with this. And this is what we'd like to show you tonight, is that the fact that uh, we went back, when we our book came out in 2009, uh, the Kogan. Okay. Yeah, uh, Charles Kogan came to our event. He was the second man up to the microphone and he said specifically, he said, I don't, I don't agree. Liz spoke about that. I don't agree with the idea about Brzezinski. I agree with your position and your supposition that the Soviets didn't want to invade, but they did. So anyway, so we went back to interview him 2015 and lo and behold, we're in the middle of the interview and he said, can I tell you a story? So this is what we'd like to show you tonight and run that video. I think it would be uh, it would be very telling for your. And this is the cha This is our challenge to Connor, Connor Tobin's right. claim that right. there is no proof that Brzezinski did in fact make the statements. Right. Uh, let me just check the setting. Share computer sound. That's what I need to do. And of course, Connor Tobin is the author of that article, The Myth uh, of the Afghan Travel. Okay, here we go. Connor is elected on a peace platform, but he brings in Zbigniew Brzezinski as national security advisor. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski is known to be a Russophobe, well known in his writings. Uh, Stansville Turner, CIA oh, director, missing the sound? What's disparages the Team B findings. We can hear but Brzezinski it. advances their political agenda inside the White House. Brzezinski has a long reputation. Uh, he is a strange pick for advancing to time. 
Paul Warnke, in an interview that we did with him in 1993, referred to Brzezinski as a neoconservative, but a whole lot smarter. I wouldn't quite agree with that. <laughs> well, I would never call him a neoconservative. I, he was, a, he was a, <coughs> a hostile to the Soviet Union, yes, but not as a neocon. Not as an in fact, today, uh, Brzezinski is on the right side of just about every issue. Today he is. Yes. In fact, I had an exchange with him. Which, should I recount this? Yes, please. Uh, this was at the uh, funeral ceremony or the reception uh, for Sam Huntington. Brzezinski was there. I'd never met him before. And uh, I went up to him and I introduced myself and I said, I agree with everything you're doing and saying, except for one thing. You gave an interview to the Nouvel Observateur uh, some years back saying that we sucked the Soviets into Afghanistan. I said, I have never uh, heard or accepted that idea. And he said to me, you may have had your own perspective from the agency, but we had our different perspective from the White House. And he insisted that this was correct. And I, I still, uh, I mean, that, that is obviously the way he felt about it, but uh, I didn't get any whiff of that when I was chief near East South Asia at the time of the Afghan uh, war against the Soviets. There was uh, Robert Gates, his book, From the Shadows, 1996, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, stated that the, the, the issues, he starts the section in his book by stating that it was early in, 19, early in 1979 when he began, his staff began debating whether they should, quote, create a Vietnam a situation or Russia's Vietnam mm -hmm. for the Soviets. Well, as, as uh, Zabinsky, uh, Brzezinski said, you have your perspective, and we had a different perspective from the White House. Now, as Chief Near East South Asia, uh, we were not at the political level of U.S. decision-making, although we were in very close relationship with state, particularly during the Iran hostage crisis. Uh, I, I was in almost daily contact with Harold Saunders, who was my counterpart in the State Department. But that's still, it's not at the high political level of the White House. So uh, I can accept what Brzezinski said, but it's the first time I'd heard of it, and I was surprised when I read it in the in this French uh, uh, magazine. So you really think that he, he knew more than than you ever were aware of, or being, being made aware of? Uh, yes, and what, and that, what you say from the Gates book corroborates this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Very interesting. Yes, the truth is out, um, and uh, I hope that the uh, the history books will will correct this. But why do, why do you think this article came out now? Uh, I'm really, you know, it's I was really curious about this, and of course it irked me to no end. But I'm wondering about the timing of it. I mean, there's. Uh, you know, this is a time when a lot of, um, uh, certainly a lot of American progressives, but also maybe a lot of Americans, including uh, some folks in the military, are wondering why the U.S. is still in Afghanistan. And of course, this is also a time when um, some negotiations are taking place, such as they are, but, uh, you know, um, it might actually be a lost cause. But why do you think this article came uh, out when it did just now? I mean, do you have any any thoughts about that? And of course, um, let me just you know let you um, elaborate more also on on the Kogan um, interview. Well, well, I think that the um, the Novell Observatory interview is literally the most popular piece of evidence that has been used. In fact, I believe that's the reason that a lot of the evidence that's sort of deep research, where you really have to go into, you know, lengthy analysis and lengthy research, it's much more difficult to convince people. When you have a quote like that from Brzezinski, it really gets people's attention. And I think they really were just finally trying to kill it, that they'd been trying to kill it since 1998. But now Brzezinski is dead for a few years, and it's time to get rid of it. And that's how we have to begin to understand. That is how history has been written for a very long time. And it really is littered with all kinds of, of ideological agendas. And that's our point about this thing called magical thinking, where you get people inside these institutions with huge power, great power, 
who literally feel they have a right to leave the record as they see fit. It is not, to, and it has nothing to do with what the facts are. In fact, what we're really living in is, is something even more tragic than facts, uh, uh, you know, not being used properly. We're talking about facts being completely turned inside out or thrown out. So, you know, it, it creates completely, as I said, uh, Charlie Wilson's war is the, you know, the most logical, the, the story most Americans think is what happened. So, and Brzezinski, not only that, but uh, Connor Tobin also stated in the article, if it turned out to be true, that Carter and Brzezinski, it was convinced by Brzezinski to do this, then we have to completely rethink the Carter legacy. And that's what we feel that Connor Tobin has to be challenged with. That's, course, that's, yeah, that's exciting. Go, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to say, we have this whole anti-Russian fervor that's been going on for the last four years. Yeah. And so, uh, what does what Stephen Cohen call it? Uh, Russophobia or uh, uh, hysteria, the hysterical attitude that the uh, party has taken towards uh, anything Russian. Anything yeah. Russian. Yeah. They can't do anything right. Now it's the anti. Now it's the vaccine that the that Putin is that the Russians are testing. That doesn't work either. So uh, it, so you almost have to say, well, whatever I'm hearing about what's going on with Russia at this particular moment, you have to almost discount it and look at it from another perspective. And that is, is that what really is going on here? There's so much happening in terms of Afghanistan. There are so many things that are going on. I mean, one of the things that has com been completely overlooked, and I think we probably talked about this originally, was that in 1977, 1978, after the, the collapse of Vietnam and the American occupation there, the heroin trade moved from Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos to guess where? The Pakistan-Afghanistan border. Right. In fact, there was a there was a book that had been written by, I believe, a Japanese investigator back in 1973 or 1972, saying flat out that that's where the industry was going to move when the Americans got out of Southeast Asia. It, uh, it was going to it was going to move to South Central Asia, right. and they talked about all the the uh, the drug dealers in Pakistan and the Northwest Frontier Province that were quite willing and ready to pick up and turn it into an industry. And what is it today? Today, right. it is now the, the uh, largest heroin producing uh, operation in the world, in history. Enormous, staggering amounts of, of uh, illicit drugs come out of that part of the world. So this is a, an incentive. And as far as negotiating with the Taliban is concerned, which is almost uh, from the very beginning, I mean, that was one of the things that uh, Charles Kogan had said. He considered the Taliban to be a wholly owned subsidiary. I think that's what he right, referred to right. as a wholly owned subsidiary of Pakistan's intelligence directorate of the ISI. So they were the creation of Saudi Arabia, Pakistani military. They were basically Pashtuns who had been disenfranchised by the PDPA. And they came back and they, once the, the United States picked up and started aligning with Massoud and his Tajiks, that had always been a conflict between the Tajiks and the Pashtuns in Afghanistan. The territory, the Pashtuns were the larger eth ethnic uh, grouping. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, and ultimately, um, one of the agendas from the le left over from the British um, Empire was the attitude that they really never wanted to have yeah. a modern Muslim state. That was a, an actual goal to destroy any right. kind of, and that look at what we're looking at in Lebanon today. These are all countries that at one point were considered moderate and right. modern and moving in a modern direction. And Afghanistan was clearly one of those countries trying to move in that direction from you know, the 19th century and into the 20th century. So I think that this idea uh, that the US at this point is really kind of fulfilling the old British agenda of well, the totally idea, breaking Afghanistan right. as a sovereign nation. Well, the idea was to also, I mean, uh, nationalists were equally uh, as, as hated by the by the powers that, that be in the West, by, by the British Empire and by the United States subsequently, uh, as, uh, as the communists were. So it was as much a war against nationalism. So that's where you get the war, Dawood. the subversion yeah. of Dawood, you right. get the subversion of Gaddafi, you get the subversion of uh, Assad, you get the subversion of all of these different uh, Arab leaders. So, yeah. yeah. No, I was just yeah. going to say. What's that there? Question. Any questions? Mosaddegh, yes, yeah, yeah. Mosaddegh, sorry. Of course, of course, and, and Nasser. Yeah, yes, yeah, Nasser. absolutely. So, yeah. Yes, uh, no, you're right. Um, these kinds of modernizing, nationalistic, third-worldist leaders were absolutely anathema, 
even though they were also anti-communist, but you know, yeah. so they hated, uh, so the United States and the Brits hated nationalists as much as they did um, communists. You're absolutely right about that. Um, and it's interesting what you were saying about the, um, uh, you know, the drug industry, the, uh, the heroin uh, industry. So one of the legacies of what happened at the end of the Vietnam War and the shifting of um, the heroin trade and such to, um, to Afghanistan, one of the legacies is that you have this dreadful drug addiction problem um, in Iran mm -hmm. um, because of this drug uh, trade and smuggling from, uh, from Afghanistan. And it's a very, very serious problem and it, and it has been for, um, for a few years. Um, I, I just want to make, um, uh, you know, a little intervention here to say that, of course, you were in Afghanistan in 81 and 83, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I was there in 89, in January, February um, of 89, um, the, uh, the last of the Soviet troops were actually leaving um, uh, at that point, and it was at the end of, you know, a very long and um, you know, very tragic um, internationalized um, civil war, because on the one hand, on one side, you had the, um, uh, the government of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan and the um, Soviet, the Red Army, which, uh, you know, which had been sucked into <laughs> um, Afghanistan by Brzezinski. Um, and then um, on the other hand, you had the, the Mujahideen, this seven party tribal Islamist, highly patriarchal, utterly reactionary um, uh, group of rebels supported by the United States, China, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and um, lots of also diplomatic and moral support given by, uh, I mean, even countries like Sweden and France. I mean, it was very odd, you know, to me um, to see that kind of support for um, these, uh, you know, the, these rebels who were being compared to, let's say, the Sandinistas, and in fact, they were nothing like them, nothing like them whatsoever. But um, uh, when I was there in uh, early 1989, you know, the government was trying its best to hold mm -hmm. on, and they did hold on, even after the Soviets left, um, until, um, you know, April of 1992, when everything collapsed. Um, and the, uh, the Mujahideen took over. The Mujahideen took over and then started this, you know, fighting amongst each other, almost decimating, destroying Kabul, which had been, you know, left more or less intact um, during the 1980s. But when I was there in um, 89, the government was trying to hold on. There were still a lot of social programs um, that were going on, programs for women, programs to fight illiteracy, um, programs to improve health care, um, some kind of, uh, you know, housing programs too, which, uh, you know, some Soviet, um, you know, engineers would be coming in and helping them build um, these, uh, these housing units too. And I was just so taken by that. And I was also taken by how modest uh, Kabul looked, especially when compared to my memory of uh, Tehran. And remember, I had left Tehran in 1975 to go to college in Canada. And um, Tehran was this thriving cosmopolitan, you know, um, city with a big middle class and a modern working class and fancy housing. And of course, my father had been a, um, um, uh, a civil servant. I mean, he was an official of the road, uh, Ministry of Roads and Transportation. There were railroads and, you know, national airways and roads, uh, road construction all over Iran. And Afghanistan was nothing like that. I was so surprised by how modest Kabul was and how um, actually um, really um, underdeveloped Afghanistan was. And I kept thinking to myself then and still today, what Afghanistan would have looked like today had Carter and Brzezinski not made that fateful decision to intervene when they did to subvert and undermine a modernizing uh, pro-women's rights um, uh, government and then just destroy any hope for any kind of advancement for the people, um, for uh, uh, you know, various social programs, infrastructure, and so on. And uh, Afghanistan was never given that chance because once the Americans, um, once the Soviets left, 
some fighting continued. And then of course, in Charlie uh, Wilson's war, the one um, fault that um, is, uh, is addressed to the US is that why did you just leave Afghanistan on its own in 1992? I mean, that's the only mistake supposedly that the United States no. made. Right. No, the United States made a big mistake much earlier on. So um, uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts about, um, uh, about what Afghanistan might have looked like had uh, Brzezinski not made that um, uh, intervention? Well, I've actually oftentimes uh, thought about if Brzezinski had used his power to basically deal, if he wanted to, whatever he wanted to do with the Soviet Union, he had left Afghanistan alone, he did, and he sacrificed Afghanistan for his lust to win the Cold War, okay, um, that 9-11 would never have happened, and that 9-11 would actually have been the natural, probably, collapse of the Soviet structure, that something else that the Soviet Union was definitely in a process of deterioration. There clearly were, it was hastened by their involvement in Afghanistan, but it was not the cause of it. That was already ongoing. And I think that Brzezinski also did not just draw the Soviets into Afghanistan, but now we can see the US has been brought in. And it is the, uh, this is the land where empires die. So in a kind of irony, I think that you know, to me, that is the sort of final, I think, lesson of imperial thinking. It is a very pyrrhic victory. And if you live long enough, you will find out that it wasn't the victory you thought. And I think Brzezinski actually lived long enough to realize that the U.S. was never going to benefit the way he imagined from being the preeminent imperial power in the world. And he couldn't get anyone to listen to him by the end of his life in the meaningful ways that he was talking about about the misuse of imperial power by the United States and its inability to basically mature as an empire. So I think that that is the ultimate lesson, um, I think, of an imperial mind like Brzezinski's. Sound, we can't hear you. That is really um, a, a wonderful, uh, very insightful commentary, um, Liz. That's absolutely true. And that is what has happened to the United States in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, you know what? Uh, what is going to happen um, in the near future is um, I, I don't know. It's up in the air, frankly. Um, Paul, is there uh, anything you'd like to add? Or um, I'm wondering if we should open this up to any questions that members of our audience might have. That would Anyone be great. Has a sure. Question? Sure. All right. Any um, people can raise their hand or um, just um, jump in. So you, you can go to the participants window and find your name and there's a thing that says raise hand. You can do it that way or you can just go like this and maybe we'll see you. <laughs> may we may not. <laughs> or you could just write it in the chat. That's the other way. Yeah. yeah. This has been quite an interesting, um, this article really, um, you know, uh, really threw me for a loop. I was surprised that it actually came came out when it did, and it's written by somebody in Ireland, right? Um, yeah, which is uh, you know, which is also very counterintuitive. I mean, you know, what's that about? Why, and so on. Um, but um, um, but trying to revisit that era and trying to whitewash. Um, the uh, the Carter administration. Um, very, it's a very clumsy effort. He made some some really glaring errors in terms of what he used for Brzezinski during that time period. I mean, that one of the things he did is cite that Molotov Ribbentrop um, quote, uh, where supposedly this is the misquote: Brzezinski told Carter the reason why the Soviets were going into Afghanistan was is that this had been in the pipeline since World War II and the molotov ribbentrop agreement, uh, the Nazi-Soviet agreement, where the Soviet Molotov, the Soviet representative, had said to Ribbentrop, yes, our interests are in the Indian Ocean and below Afghanistan into the Persian Gulf, okay? So this is a mis- it was a misinterpretation. Gartov actually has it in his book 
as an example of the kind of abuse that Brzezinski used to do and the kind the way he would misinform the president about things historically that weren't true. And so it would be the opposite of that. In fact, it was it was the Nazi, it was Ribbentrop that made the suggestion at, at Hitler's request about whether the whether if they went around in certain areas in the Ukraine and did what they were going to do in Baku and uh, in that part of the world, would the Soviets take up the position? Would they go in and assume the responsibility for Afghanistan and those areas south of uh, south of Baku in that area? And so, as a result of that, um, it was it was the opposite. And Molotov wouldn't respond. In fact, he finally had to say, "No, we didn't do. That. We, we have no intention." moving in, uh, into those areas. Okay, so it was a, a, the exact opposite. It again, so it's yeah. very surprising that Tobin uh, would pick that particular example to use as something that Brzezinski, proof. Okay. as proof of, of Brzezinski's position. Legitimacy. <laughs> of, yeah, that, that the Soviets so were, will, were going yeah. to go to the Persian Gulf. Whether so. he's literally just sloppy, or <laughs> whether they, they get to a point where they think they can get away with anything, yeah. It's hard to really know because it, it was it's so grotesque in its misrepresentation, yeah. right. phenomenally grotesque. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. really stirred us when we first saw it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, this idea that the Soviets in, invaded um, Afghanistan to get to the warm water ports of the Indian Ocean, that was one of those tropes that was just being thrown about throughout the 1980s and into the early 1990s. It was driving me crazy at the time, I remember. They actually had a CIA story floating around at that time that claimed that the Soviets were running out of oil, which wasn't true. So that was, kind, that was part of the propaganda campaign right. to set things in motion so Brzezinski could pick up on them and then use them right. to the policy in Washington. Right. Exactly. The, in fact, the three days that Dan Rather played that video about the Soviet troop rotation claiming it proved it was Russia's Vietnam yeah. was a part of that propaganda campaign. Right. And that happened, as you know, that would have been in 1983 when that happened. Yeah. I want to read, let me read a, a quote to you. This is a guy who was a member of the National Security Council. His name is Helmer. John Helmer, and he was uh, he wrote in a blog post in 19 in 2017. He said, from the start, in the first six months of 1977, Carter also warned explicitly by his own staff inside the White House not to allow Brzezinski to dominate his policy making to the exclusion of all other advice and the erasure of the evidence on which that advice was based. Uh. So therefore, if you're, an, if, you're, if you're an academic and you're going in and looking at the official record, and don't count into the fact that Brzezinski was known to get people, he could, took control right down to, of all the meetings that the president had. He took control right down to the fact he typed up the notes of the meeting and then presented them and interpreted them for the president. So this is the kind of thing that people were warning Jimmy Carter about, which he apparently didn't listen to. So, well, well, I heard... So I'll ask a question if others, if you'll permit me. Let's uh, take our speakers to the present day. It's 2020. A new uh, Cold War is beginning between the China, Russia, and the United States. Whether Afghanistan, why is the United States in Afghanistan today in the current conditions? And what are the forces that might make it leave? Well, I'd say the first reason is strategic position. I think this has been the plan all along. Afghanistan is centrally located. Uh, it's the belly button of South Central Asia. Uh, it has a, and the drug trade is set up. And the there. drug trade is already set up and very lucrative. I'm sure that there are people who are part of this process who are benefiting greatly from that. That's, that's one reason why they're still there, and that's one reason why they're still there in the first place. Also because of Iran. And because right. they, want, they want to maintain um, a presence right at Iran's uh, doorstep. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And so, um, in terms of what can be done about that, I think that uh, once again, people just need to know what you guys are doing is fantastic in terms of just getting people to understand what the real issues are, and the fact, and not be deceived. Um, well, I, I, that's our point about understanding this thing called magical thinking is a right. very serious mental disease that has mm -hmm. taken over and had taken over Washington long ago.
that's our point. In fact, preceding what Brzezinski did in 1979, there were plenty of crazy people like him running around, but they didn't have total control. They took over once Brzezinski pulled the, the stunt. It became the sort of causes belli that has allowed the whole Reagan era, building up the defense budget to the highest level since World War II, was totally based on that. And they have never come back from that. And the neocons have only become more and more entrenched. So you can see that in the, in the anti, uh, you know, Soviet thing that morphs into the anti-Russian thing, and we really never ended the war, and this is the new Cold War, and now we have, you know, you know, it keeps going on and on, because the point is that they are totally addicted to war, and that, I believe, is the ultimate, we call it late stage imperial dementia. It is literally a, a point at which it, 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 it is, it's totally insane, but they have so much power and they're good at holding it. So I think we have a big job ahead of us, but the first thing we have to begin to recognize is the ease with which the manipulators of the information can keep you twisting and turning in all kinds of ways and miss and, kind of the- And distracted. The, yeah, and, the, and connect the strong, important dots, as it were. Okay. Those dots are, in fact, um, somewhat easy to connect because you can draw a, a straight line. Uh, for those of us who do not suffer from magical thinking, you can draw a straight line from uh, the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, 77, 78, 79, to 9-11, 9-11 mm -hmm. to 2003, the invasion of uh, uh, Iraq, 2003 to then 2011 and the NATO invasion and bombing of Libya and the intervention in Syria. Mm -hmm. And look where Libya is today, look where Syria is today, look where uh, Afghanistan is today, look where Iraq is today. Iraq still hasn't recovered either. So all of these cases actually begin with uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan is extremely significant historically it's very, very important um, event, uh, not only in terms of what was going on with the Cold War and the collapse of communism, but what its legacy has been up until today. And it's been very, very destructive. Um, and um, you know, I wish I could be more hopeful and optimistic about a way out, but to be perfectly honest, I myself cannot see a way out because Afghanistan has also been this political football, um, you know, early on between uh, the two superpowers. And then since there, since then, all these other, uh, you know, neighboring powers that have intervened, uh, the U.S. going in again in 2001, there was the Mujahideen, and then there was the Taliban. And the country has simply been deteriorating ever since. And it has simply not recovered. Yeah. And that's the same with the other countries, too. So it's a very, very sorry tale and sorry record. Well, someone once told us when we first got involved in this sort of thing back in the early 1970s, he said, it's all internally consistent, which is kind of a scary thought when you think about it, all the destruction, all the wars, all the people who have gone. When you look at Afghanistan as an example, Zame Alizad was recruited by the CIA, yeah. brought to the United States, educated at the University of, uh, well, eventually, Nebraska, I believe it was originally, and then uh, by Tom Gutier, right. was recruited by Tom Gutier, and then, and then sent back, and who is now negotiating the peace treaty between the United States and the Taliban? Now, you know, and who, who did he come, who was he put under the tutelage of? Albert Walsh, the premier, neocon, neoconservative, who was the guy who actually got back in 1972, 1973, wrote a letter, I believe, to the Wall Street Journal about the need for a separate team that would go in and analyze the CIA's faults. That becomes Team B. Team B is Richard Pipes, the man who replaces the big Brzezinski when the Reagan administration comes in. So all of these things, the, the ethnic foreign, the Paul Warranty described the policy, the, uh, the uh, policy, foreign policy of the United States to us is ethnic foreign policy because of Brzezinski. Because of Brzezinski. Yeah. But it became, that was something that, that began to happen when Brzezinski went in. In 1978, he formed the, uh, what was it, the Nationalities Working Group. 
with Samuel Huntington, Paul Hens, uh, Graham Fuller, the objective of which was to go into places like the, south, the southern Afghan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, go into these areas in Afghanistan, find the disgruntled tribal people, and get them inflamed against Moscow. That was the whole objective of it. Right. And when, when Brzezinski left the White House, it was actually, uh, it's in, um, it's in uh, Wilson Casey's uh, biography. He said that he wanted to bring uh, Brzezinski over to be the national security advisor for Reagan. But it was just too impossible to get him through the right wing to, in order for him to do that. And he was too many left wing associations and too, too close to David Rockefeller. So that's when they brought in Richard Pipes. Richard Pipes took it over, the Nationalities Working Group. And that the whole objective was, he's on record as saying, the idea is to inflame the Muslim population of the Soviet Union against communist rule. And that is still going on. That yeah. program is still happening. It is internally consistent. It doesn't look like it from here. Bombs going off, uh, the depots going off in Lebanon, uh, countries being laid waste. But the fact is, is that it, it is serving someone's purpose. The question is, whose purpose is it served? Not ours, that's for sure. <laughs> not, not, the, not, not the people. Hey, this, uh, or the people of Afghanistan, right, or the people right. of Lebanon, or anyone else. Right. Not at all. Well, um, this has been really quite, uh, quite an instructive uh, talk. What you've uh, done is really turn magical thinking on its head. Um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, according to magical thinking, um, and this, you know, pervasive, um, um, unrelenting disinformation that we have uh, been subjected to, it was all about the Soviet Union. It was the Soviet invasion and how they destroyed Afghanistan and it's all their fault, et cetera. Right. Well, we've actually, tonight, we have put the spotlight on the United States mm -hmm. and on the Carter administration in particular, and that fateful decision at the very end of the Carter administration to intervene in what was really an internal matter in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, and again, very similar to what happened in uh, you know, Libya and Syria in 2011. These are internal issues and matters. It is between the people and their government, and it's the people and the, uh, their government that should determine the outcomes not ex external forces. So this is actually um, what is uh, really tragic about Afghanistan, that it was never able to fully realize, from my perspective, to realize those you know, very, um, very progressive objectives of that April 1978 revolution um, and what might have been um, when I think about it, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's very sad. And when I think about what happened to all those wonderful people that I met uh, when I was there in um, uh, early 1989, people who had to flee, of course, um, and seek asylum in all kinds of countries, um, some of whom, by the way, I, I managed to see again in, in, in subsequent years. Um, but it's, uh, it's a very, very um, tragic, uh, sad, and in many ways a criminal um, uh, situation. Crimes against humanity does come to mind, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, yeah. We, we, we went back in 2002, as you know, and, and uh, we went back and, and uh, you know, camera, camera bag on the shoulder and the whole deal, and it was just devastating to see the conditions in which that country had been reduced. And as you said, it was already backward, was already an undeveloped country. It was Cabal, undeveloped, but it Cabal itself, but the people are wonderful. The, the people just, it, it, it restored your faith in your enemy, just to see how these people had lived through that. The, just the natural ability of a human being to survive and thrive in that kind of environment. On the one hand, on the other hand, the tragic and unnecessary waste of human life and, and, a, and a, budding, a budding civilization was, uh, you know, just crushed by this process and is still being crushed for that matter and thoughtlessly. Yeah. And, and thoughtlessly indeed. No, you're right about the Afghan people too. Of, of course, you know, we speak the same language. So it was wonderful for me to be there and to be speaking. Um, of course, they call it daddy, we call it Farsi, but you know, we do talk to each other and um, it, there was a certain bonding um, that took place um, between myself and whether it was, you know, the, the people who were working at the hotel 
or you know the folks at the um, the People's Democratic uh, Party of Afghanistan, um, with whom I also became very close. It was um, you know it 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 was a certain type of um, uh, of bonding, and it was a beautiful country too. Oh my gosh, those mountains! Yeah. Oh. That's right. The Americans started bombing the mountains. Remember when they invaded in 2001, when they attacked in 2001? It was, it was really quite appalling. But it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And um, um, yes, well, that was then. This is now. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate. But Liz and Paul, Liz Gould, Paul Fitzgerald, thank you so much for this outstanding talk. Thank you for everything that you have done, actually, over the years. It, it really takes uh, very courageous um, and, um, uh, uh, and brave people like yourselves and, and really knowledgeable people like yourselves to try to undo these decades of magical thinking and disinformation <laughs> and really uh, shed light on uh, what really has happened um, uh, you know, um, in, uh, in various parts of the world. I very much hope that you do write um, a response to the article. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, it does get published and um, I will certainly, you know, try to contact um, uh, the, the folks there and, and ask them please to, to do so. But, um, um, but you have all the details and all the information and um, I think there really does need to be a, a response to, um, to that article, which really has done a, a great disservice to the truth um, and to the historical record. Um, ironically, given that, um, you know, it was published in, um, uh, in a history piece. So um, thank you again. Um, all the best to you. Of course, we will, um, you know, stay in touch. And um, uh, I want to thank also um, the, uh, uh, the staff at Mass Peace Action for the technical um, uh, capability that uh, allowed us to, uh, to hold this webinar. So much. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone who attended tonight. We will probably have a write-up, um, which uh, we will post um, on the website um, about tonight. And of course, the recording will be there as well. So thanks again, and good night. Good, good night. night. <laughs>